baptism. So we're one. Amen. 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 We're Christians. We're one. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask if Pastor Dixon will come up and uh, and greet you. And then I'm going to pray and turn it over to Sister Mandy and this beautiful choir band. We're going to worship Jesus. Amen. 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 Pastor Dixon, if you'll come.
Lord, I pray that your will would be done. Each and every heart and mind and facility and property, it is all yours. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's in the precious name of Jesus. You deserve the glory and the honor. Amen. 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 Turn around if you would, shake some hands.
be seated for just a moment as as we worship the Lord in our giving. Uh, Hallelujah. We want to encourage everybody, everybody from both congregations to continue to do as you normally do. Um, we have worked this out, uh, so don't don't you worry about this. This is a time of worship. Yeah. Amen. This is a time of worship to the Lord. Yeah. And uh, we give God praise for the giving. Uh, you know, as these men are serving you, you guys go ahead. Serve them. I pray the Lord bless this offering. I pray that, I pray that He used it to build His kingdom and to reach souls. I don't want to take from the moment that we're in right now. Because His presence is here. And as I was standing there, I was thinking about how awesome God is. And that when He comes, how awesome that moment's going to be. And so I don't uh, I don't focus much on the past. I try not to. But I'm so focused on the future and what God has in store for His kingdom until He comes. I tell our people. My job as a pastor is to get you ready for departure. Amen. Because Jesus is coming. Amen. There's nothing greater I can do for you than to tell you the truth and get you ready for that great day. Because as sure as we're standing here, as sure, as sure as you're sitting down, I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. We might not ever get out of this service and Jesus could come. And I read in the Bible of when He's coming. Nobody can. Well, I guess people, if they really wanted to, they could argue with God in Scripture. This is what I found not to be in the Scriptures. That when Jesus comes, that there's going to be certain, such a move of God, such power, that He's, he's going to transcend all that we could possibly think and ask and what I don't find in the scripture where he says, All right, everybody get in line. <laughs> Presbyterians, you go first. <laughs> Methodists, you can go next. Church of God, though, I think we have a great network. Y'all in 180, y'all can go next. Pope Chapel, you can go. Agape, you can go. I don't see that in the scriptures. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to read to you what I see in the Scriptures when He comes. He's coming for His bride. It don't matter, don't matter what church you're affiliated with. He's coming for His bride. He says this in 1 Thessalonians. This is our future. I do not want you to be ignorant, brother. According to those who have fallen asleep, Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, yeah. even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. Yeah. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ are going to rise. And then we, I said, we,
looking at all kinds of diseases and things. They're looking at their checking account, their retirement account. They're looking at the things that they have built on this earth. But the Word of God says all these things will pass away. If we are looking unto Him, the Word says, Who is the author? That means He began a good work in you. And the finisher, the one who's going to bring it to an end. That's the Lord.
I simply entitled it Into the Future. How many of you are going into the future? I mean, it's a new day. It's a new season. You're moving. All of us are moving. If you are alive and breathing air, you are moving into your future. Five seconds from now, you're into your future. We are moving forward. God has purpose and plans for us. But I thought about how right here today, you as a church body are moving into your future. And there's so it's a catchy phrase and there's movies that talk about it. But here's the fact. In the word of God, the psalmist David is in agreement. And I want you to note that in Psalm 139 verses 5 and 6. The Word of God makes a declaration. And in that declaration, the psalmist says in the New King James, he says, You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And then I thought, I love the, I love the, the message version. It kind of speaks today. Look at what it says there. I look behind me. And you are there and then up ahead and there you are too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. The psalmist said, this is too much for me. Amen. It's too much. It's too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Amen. When I think about the future and, and how God ordains our steps and how God has ordained your steps today. I want you to know that the psalmist penned it so well because what he said is true today. He looked back on his relationship with God. And looking back, he said, God, I saw you in my past. Amen. He said, not only did I see you, but you hedged me in. That means he came in behind you. Aren't you glad that he is your rear guard? Amen. No devil can sneak up on you. No weapon formed against you can come at you from behind you. Because he has hedged you in. And the psalmist looked back. Church, I want to tell you. Look back. Before you go forward, take a pause and look back at where God has brought you from. And when you are thankful, you will be thankful. When you take time to think about his goodness and all he's done for you, you will begin to thank him for his blessings. And what that does is builds faith inside of you. And he said, I look behind me and, and there you are. And then he said, and up ahead, God. That's where the faith kicks in. Into my future. God, you are, you, if you've been with me, you are going to be ahead of me. Because he said he knows what? Our end from our beginning. He said, I go before you. I've got a purpose, a plan. He said to the prophet Jeremiah, I'm thinking great thoughts about you to give you peace and a future and a hope. That's the word of the Lord for his people. And so when the psalmist looks ahead, he has faith to know and believe that God has already gone ahead of him. There's a word that was preached back in Tennessee Prayer Conference. I had the privilege in Mobile, Alabama two weeks ago to find the pastor there who preached it. And I walked up to him and I said, I asked God to give me this moment and today's the day. I said, I have to tell you that your message transformed my life. And it was just one phrase that he spoke under the anointing of the Lord that night. I want to share that phrase with you. Here's what he said. He was talking about how that God goes before us. And he said this, this phrase. He said, the Lord has gone before you and he has established his awaiting grace in the place that he already knows you're going to be. When he spoke that message that night, it gripped my heart. I don't remember anything else he said. Because in that moment, when the Spirit of the Lord brought that word to me, the Lord began to talk to me right there at the pew. And He's been talking to me ever since about that. And so picture in your mind kind of what the psalmist was saying. What is awaiting grace? Awaiting grace is the grace of God that has gone before you. Pastor, it came here before you ever knew it was here. And in this place, His grace... His provision, everything you need, has been established. And all you do is walk into the church. All you do is go into your new facility knowing that God has already settled. His power, His anointing, His miracles, His provision, it is already there. And the psalmist said, I look behind me and there you are. And up ahead, there you are as well. 
And he says, it is too wonderful for me to comprehend. You know, I think about how that I believe that there are times in our life as we're moving into our future that we've got to remember some things. And I want to share some things with you. Three in particular. Number one, we've got to remember that where God leads us, you will define the place. The place will not define you. Wherever God leads you, you define the place. It does not define you. Now what's so powerful about that thought is simply this. As you are walking into your future and you're moving into territory that you've never stood in, you've never served in, you've never worshipped God in, you move into that place, it's not always going to be a bed of roses. It's not going to always be a moment when you wake up and there's a song on your heart. Instead, the propensity for us in adversity is to complain. To, to be dissatisfied and forget all of God's provision. But the places that God leads us to are the places of His blessing and provision. Adversities will come. But we don't let those moments define us. Instead, we look behind and remember His goodness. And then we declare in the place of adversity, Lord, You are with me. Your awaiting grace went before me. And so as I step into that place, I know, God, that I will declare the goodness of the Lord in my situation. We look at people. How do people who have been diagnosed with terminal illness come into the house of the Lord, lift up their hands, and declare that Jesus is their healer? How is it that sometimes Jesus miraculously heals them, and at other times He takes them on to be with Him? We don't question the will of God. We know He is still the healer. And we declare, and those who are God's testify to the goodness of God. Amen. Even when adversity says otherwise. Amen. Even when what we see says otherwise. And so as you move into your future, remember that wherever God leads you, you will define the place. It will not define you. Do we have any people in the room that study psychology? Don't be afraid. I see one here. Do I have a psychologist in the room? Okay. How many of you literally, now Now that I broke the ice and a few hands went up, be honest, how many of you took psychology in high school or college? There we go. Now I know my audience. I'm sorry, I forgot to look behind me. There we go. There is a term in psychology, and it's called place identity. I'm going to read this. It's a core concept in the field of environmental psychology. Which proposes that identities form in relationship to environments. And so the argument is that place identity becomes a substructure of a person's self-identity. And it consists of knowledge and feelings that are developed through everyday experiences within that physical space. Let's bring it down to North Carolina lingo. You are a product of your environment. That's what it is. That's what place identity is. You are a product of your environment. And so let me bring it down to Langley, South Carolina. How many of you know where Aiken, South Carolina is? There's a little town between Aiken and Augusta, Georgia, string of towns, and uh, it's called LBC High School when I was growing up, Langley Bath Clearwater. There's on the north, Graniteville, Warrenville, Balkaloose, all those little towns. They're mill towns, little cotton mill towns. That's where I grew up, in a little tiny town. Well, in that little tiny town, that green thing, that water runs through, that you, we call it a hose pipe. So I'm a, I, anybody ever call it a hose pipe? Yeah. So I'm a youth pastor in Florida, and we're having our first car wash. And I had some Yankee boys in the car. And what, I'm over there, and I'm tired of the complaining from my customers because the wheels. Now, I'm dating myself. Remember when white walls were on the top? You had to have them white. That's called, uh, why they're called white walls. <laughs> and so customers are complaining that my youth group's not getting clean. So I get the brill over there, and I jump down, and I'm on tire duty because I'm a humble guy. Right? I'm down on my knees. I'm sweating in Florida summer heat. I'm getting, I look over, I said, throw me that hose pipe. This boy from Queens, New York. <laughs> he goes. He looked at me. I go, what are you doing? Hurry up. I go, throw me the hose pipe. He looks around. I go, don't mess with me, boy. I said, this is dry, 
And I need to get up. He goes, Pastor Brian, what's a hose pipe? <laughs> I said, you Yankee. It's a garden hose, a water hose. He goes, why didn't he say so? <laughs> Place identity. My grandmother, when she cooked a certain meal, she called them maters and taters. Amen. Just kind of rolls off the tongue, maters and taters. What's for dinner, Greg? Maters and taters. Tomatoes and potatoes. <laughs> Place identity. You know, now that I've got it in your mind, you know there are things that you call things a certain thing because of where you were raised, because of the physical environment that you were raised in. Other people look at you like you're crazy. What are you talking about? It is because of where we are. Can I tell you, that's all fine and good in our everyday life. But when it comes to your spiritual walk with God and the journey that God has got you on, don't ever let place identity be a part of your spirituality. Why? Because God says, I have gone before you. My grace is awaiting your arrival in every place in your future that I call you to. So when you get there and you encounter adversity, adversity does not define you. Situations that are adverse do not define you. He said, instead, you will define the place. Yeah. You will define the situation. Yeah. So the next time your flesh wants to rise up in your adversity, put flesh on hold. Think about the God that has kept you in your past. Think about the one who has gone before you. And in the moment, stand there and declare that the favor and the blessing and the power of God is abiding with you right where you are. Those are the things that the Lord declares over our life. The psalmist David also made a declaration in the very familiar verse of Scripture in Psalm 23, verses 4 and 5. You know the verse he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He was where? In the valley of the shadow of death. I envision he's in this place and it's like dark shadows are dancing on the walls of the, the cave that he's walking through or the tunnel he's walking through. There is nothing there pleasant. And in that place he said, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Yeah. Church, I'm going to tell you today, whatever you're walking through that's dark, whether, whether you're walking through a valley of the shadow of death and you don't know where God is, I can tell you, He's right there with you. Yeah. So fear no evil. Yeah. Fear no evil. Listen to what He said. He, he said, the things that I have experienced in my walk with you, God, the, the, the rod and the staff, He uses these analogies. These things were <laughs> necessary tools that he needed as a shepherd to help him do his job. And so you think about where you're walking in adversity. And you begin to think about how that God has already been behind you and edged you in. You think about how he brought you through the darkest situation. And that becomes a tool and a weapon of your praise. And in your valley, once again, you pick up that weapon. You pick up that tool and you declare he has comforted me. But I love this part. He looks ahead. And what does he see? He says, you have prepared a table before me. You prepared a table. Now can I tell you, when I go home to South Carolina, to Langley, South Carolina, I call ahead. I call my order in. And when I call my order in, it is my favorite foods. And for me, it's something called red beef stew and crock pot macaroni. <laughs> and the little hoe cake things she calls them, they're about that thin and that big around. They're like mini pancakes, but they're crispy, crispy. Fried in a black skillet, cast iron skillet. I sit down at the table. Can I tell you? I don't just call my order ahead. I back it up with the approximate 15 minute arrival. <laughs> so that when I walk to the door, I smell it. Yeah. I smell it before I get in. When I walk into the kitchen, the table is prepared. It's not just a table. 
with that uh, old flannel graph plastic cover with the flannel graph stuff on the back, whatever I'm talking about. It's not just that. It's been on the table all my life. The table is prepared. And I pull out the chair and sit down and give God thanks and I dig in. Amen. I feast. The psalmist said, Lord, I am in my valley. I'm in a dark place. But all these provisions have been made for me. And then I look ahead and see the table that you have prepared for me. And as he sits down and he begins to feast on all the blessing and the goodness of God in the valley. Can I tell you where he's at? He's still in the valley. And in the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord has prepared for him every good and perfect gift because those come from the Father above. And as he's sitting there and feasting, it's not just enough that God blesses us with provision, but while he's sitting there, he says, you anoint my head with oil. Can you picture the psalmist? In, in, in like a reality setting, he's sitting at the table and then all of a sudden he feels something running down his neck. And I do that because when the spider gets on my neck or something starts, sweat starts running, it makes me do this. And he probably does this. What is that? He looks around and the oil of God's anointing is being poured out on him. He says, you anoint my head with oil. And then my cup runs over. And when I look at Psalm 23, I have to go back and understand that as he has prepared the table and the psalmist is feasting, he adds those words at the end where he says, and all of this is happening in the presence of my enemy. Church, I'm going to remind you today, as you move into your future, God has not only gone before you, His grace is awaiting you. He is there with every provision. But if you find yourself in a dark day or in an adverse situation and all hell's breaking loose against you, can I tell you that in your valley, just look around because everything that you ever need, He has already equipped you with it. There's a table. Open your eyes in the Spirit and look. There is a table that He has prepared. And while you pull up and feast, on the goodness of the Lord, all of a sudden the anointing of the Holy Ghost begins to pour down over you and it covers you. And in that moment as you are in the presence of the Lord, I believe because God's like one old guy said, He's a goody goody God. He looks over and you look back and there you see the devil, you see your enemy, and they are watching. They thought they had you in the valley of the shadow of death. But even in the valley, the provision of the Lord has gone before you. And there you are covered in the anointing of the Lord. And the devil is looking. He cannot touch you. Your cup is overflowing with the goodness of the Lord. So remember, wherever God leads you, you will define the place and it will not define you. Secondly, I want you to remember this. Remember that longing for what was will cripple you from what is and prevent you from what is to come. There is a human nature in all of us. And that nature, that natural man, instantly wants to complain when we find ourselves in places of adversity. The Israelites, in Numbers 11, verses 5 and 6, when they encountered adversity, the first thing out of their mouth was, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks. Now you want to talk about a spirit of complaint, these next two items they identified? Onions and garlic? <laughs> I have never longed for an onion or a <laughs> But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manner. They literally look at the miraculous provision of God and said, this manner. This manner. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were God, I would have went, <laughs> I would have been done. 
And I would have moved on. But aren't you thankful? And that is not God's nature. He's long-suffering. And He goes with us. He understands, as one guy said, that we are but dust. <laughs> Just saying what He said. He understands us. And He's merciful. And as Israel is complaining about all these things, the reality was... They could not move into their future because they allowed their wilderness experience to define them rather than them defining their experience. They developed this false sense of identity. Our whole being is dried up. Do you know in reality the Word declares otherwise? The, the Word says their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out. I mean, miracles must have happened in their body. Their shoes grew with their feet. You know, their clothes, everything they needed in the manna sustained them. They were not sick. They were healthy people. But they, they declared this false identity of who they were. God provided water and shelter were provided. Protection with the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. I've come to the realization that when we despise the provisions of God, it leads to unthankfulness. When we look at this manna, and we look at this situation, and this whatever God's put in your life, and we become unthankful, come on. then we come to this place where our heart is no longer overflowing with gratitude to God. But out of our mouth comes an abundance of complaint. In looking and moving toward the future, we've got to remember that Christ Jesus is our sustaining man. Who is He? He is the one who blesses us. He is the one who gives us our daily provision and causes us to identify His blessings in our life. Even when all of hell breaks loose against you. Even when you wake up like Job one morning and the news just can't stop. Have you had one of them days when the bad news just won't stop? It's one thing after another. But even in that moment when we know that God has gone before us, He has gone ahead of us into our future, we can stand on the provisions of God and know that God is with us and He is keeping us. And so we do not long for the things that were. We understand that in the present moment, God is for us. Amen. He is not against us. Right. He is working His purpose and His plan in our lives. Amen. As you move into your future, <coughs> you identify the places God takes you. They don't identify you. Right. You move into your future and you remember. You remember that in, in every situation... God is for you. And you don't long for the things of the past. You believe that what God has put before you is for your blessing and for your benefit. Amen. And then I want you to remember this. Stay in the moment. What does that mean? What does it mean to stay in the moment? It means to take the time to rest in the moments that God slows you down. Church, I want to tell you. Hope Chapel, as you move into your new facility, there's going to come... A day and a moment when all the pressure of getting that thing done and the memory of all those hours and days, all of a sudden you're going to walk in and it's going to be finished. That's right. Amen. It's going to be done. And you, and you say, as Pastor just said, praise God. Amen. And a lot of you are going to say, praise God. But here's what can happen. We can get to those places in our future, in those seasons where the work is done, and now we're like Israel. We're in the promised land. But just because you got to your promised land doesn't mean that there's not still work to be done. Amen. But there are seasons when it appears that all that intense labor comes to an end, and you're like, what do I do now? What do I do now? Can I tell you that... There are moments and seasons when God wants you to rest. Right. He wants you to rest. And in those seasons of rest, He says to us, just stay in the moment. Stay in the moment. What happens so many times in our life is that just because things are static, we think development has ceased. And it has not ceased. Just because there's the appearance
church that, that things are going to... Pastor, just because you're not painting walls again and laying carpet and running speakers and whatever, putting furniture together, just because all that has come to an end doesn't mean that labor has ceased. Instead, what it means is that God has prepared a place for you. God's people, He has prepared a place for you to begin to work and labor, for Him to begin to pour out His Spirit and His power to bring others into the kingdom of God. And God has placed His people in situations where He wanted them over and over and over again to experience the process. What is the process? The process with God is where He begins to develop things inside of us. You see, up to this point, He has been using the things that He's given you to get you to where you are. But now that you come into that place in your future where God has given you His place, all of a sudden God wants to begin to do a new thing. That's right. A new thing. What is that new thing? The new thing is whatever God desires. Because in that place, the old has passed away. Everything has become new. And in that new place, there are going to be experiences where God is calling up out of your spirit a new gift, a new opportunity. And you say, well, how do I step into that? How do I know what it is? How do I move into that? I believe it is this. In those seasons... When you're thinking, God, what are you doing to me next? All of a sudden, it's in those seasons where God says, my work is not static. Amen. I am moving. I am, I am working. And in that season where you're not laboring, maybe in the physical, labor in the spirit. Amen. Labor in the spirit. Because it is in the spiritual labor that God begins to do things in us and through us. Can you believe that Moses fled Egypt and got on the backside of the desert? And in that backside of the desert where he's just hanging out, he's doing nothing. All of a sudden, there was a spiritual encounter. He looked and saw a burning bush. And the Lord spoke to him. Can I tell you, when you have arrived, it doesn't mean it's time to stop. It doesn't mean it's time to sit back because the labor's done. It is in those moments that the most spiritual encounters of your life can take place. Right. In what seems to be static moments. Because there was a guy named Joseph who was sitting in a prison and he thought to himself, there is nothing happening in my life. Oh, on the contrary. In the prison, God was working in him. God was doing things in him. God got his mouth ready. Because his, his personal advancement to not forget me, Mr. Butler, as you go back. Don't forget me. God said, you're still not ready. Two more years in the prison. Two more years to develop and get you ready. Some say, why was Moses on the backside of the desert for 40 years? Can I tell you, I pray God never puts you in a static place for 40 years. But God put Moses there. But he put him there because he was a palace kid who knew nothing about wilderness living. But God said, I know what your future is because I've already gone ahead of you in the wilderness where my work and my provision is going to take place and I'm going to train you for 40 years in the wilderness. You're going to learn every plant. You're going to know where every watering hole is. You're going to know what every uh, thing is that, that could, could uh, bring harm to my people because I'm going to let you lead a nation through the wilderness. Amen. Church, as you move into your future and you find yourself in those places of adversity, oh, don't think it's just all about you. It could be that through your perseverance, God is using your testimony to bring somebody else through their wilderness. God is using your trial to bring somebody else through their trial. And don't despise the working of the Lord in your life because God goes before us. Remember to stay in the moment. Timothy is serving Paul and he's learning from Paul how to be a great pastor. Some of you are thinking in your heart, oh man, I just wish I could get to that position. I wish I could get to that place. I long to be there. Can I tell you, just stay in the moment. And in the moment, let God do in, in you what He wants to do. Let God work His work in you. Let God train you and prepare you because your moment is coming. Yeah. And when you get to that moment, go into it with full confidence that God has gone ahead of you and prepared the place.
place and He's prepared you to step into the place. Put your nose to the grind and serve Him. Do all the work of the Lord because here's what happens so often in our lives. People abort God's plan because they are not patient in God's process. People abort God's plan. Don't abort the plan of God because you're not patient. In the process. The process is where it really happens. The process is where it happens. That's where God works in, works things inside of us. He works things out of us that we didn't even know were in us. Things that, that, that He cannot use in the future. Because it's not going to work. And so there were attitudes in Joseph's life that God could not use as second in command. And so God worked them out. Because what God was telling Joseph is, it's not about somebody getting you where I've called you to be. It's about me getting you where I've called you to be. And God will work in us. God will do what He's called us to do. The Lord showed me early on in youth ministry at my very first church when I worked for a guy, and I'm careful how I say this. All I just say this. The man, I loved him. He's gone to be with the Lord. I loved him with all my heart. I would have preached his funeral if it wasn't for COVID. I preached his wife's funeral. I worked with him five years. But can I tell you, he was a workhorse. He had the old school mentality that from sun up to sun up. I didn't say sun down. <laughs> And we were in a building program. We were in a building program the first two years that I was there on staff. Yeah, my job was youth pastor, associate pastor, because he wanted me to be his associate. I led worship, directed a huge choir, three productions a year, Christmas, Easter, and Fourth of July. I mowed five acres of grass that was a little sprinkler system in South Florida. <laughs> South Florida, where it never got frost. Every five days, good vibrations. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> 225 wheel stops that the mower wouldn't get close enough to. We did. I was exhausted for two years of the five. In those two years, my friends knew my life. And they repeatedly told me about other opportunities in the state. You need to put in for this church. You need to put it. Can I tell you that every time I entertained the thought, the Lord would tell me, you are right where I have you. Right. You are right where I want you. And it was in those years starting out in ministry that God taught me to stay in the moment. Stay in the moment. Because there were things in this twenty young 20-something year old that God needed to work out of me yes. to he, so He could make room to get things into me. There was not enough space. Can I tell you, if you're full of yourself, there's no room for God. Amen. When you empty yourself, then you make room for the Spirit of God to come in and fill you, yes. to equip you, to bless you. Yes. And so, as I'm in that moment. And I, I'm, I'm moving forward. I remember one day. I was complaining to God. In prayer. And I said these words out loud. I said God. And I named my friend. He. Has it so easy. At his church. I wish. You would open the door for me. Like. Where he served. Before I can say another word of complaint, as powerfully and clearly as the Holy Spirit's ever spoken to me, the Lord said, what you think is green grass <clears throat> is astroturf. Mm. Now, I don't know how God speaks to you. That's how He spoke to me. And I paused. And I thought about it. A few days later, I called my friend. I said, you've got to enlighten me. And I started asking questions. Questions I never asked. He began to unfold for me. I said, oh, I thought 
thought you had it so good. He goes, I don't talk about it. I don't complain. He said, because you know why? He said, because this is where God put me. Amen. This is where I'll be until God moves me. Amen. Listen, people of God, as you're moving into your future, I want to tell you that God has prepared your heart. God wants to prepare you to step in to the places that He needs laborers. In this new church, in this new ministry, I told Pastor Brown last night, I said, I'm telling you, I believe it, I've seen it, I know, I know this man's heart. God has built that church. Amen. God has built that church. He's used people, but that's God's church. That's God's church. And because of it's God's purpose, God will step in and do Amen. what God desires to do. Amen. But God uses people. Yes. And you are people. And every one of you have the capacity to be completely equipped with every good work that God has called you to do and desires you to do to step in to those places. And step in. As the church is growing, as ministries are growing, God is calling up new ministries in your life. There are some of you today, and I prophesy over this because I told him, I spent an hour in prayer this morning. And in prayer in the hotel room, the Lord clearly spoke to me. And the Lord said, I am doing a new thing. A new thing in my people. But in that new thing, the Lord showed me that there are some who are afraid of God doing a new thing in your life. You have no fear. Because He has gone behind you. He has gone ahead of you. And in that moment, you have all assurance and hope that that God that stood with those in the Old and New Testament is the same God. He does not change. He is standing with you to equip you for every good work. And He's calling you to it. So do not fear when God is calling you. Whatever God's putting in your heart, do not fear Step into it, trusting the Lord, because He's already prepared the table before you. He's already gone ahead of you. He's equipping you for every good work. As you move into your future, know that He is moving right there with you. Amen. As the musicians come, I'm closing with this offer. There are resources that will abound to supply your every need. There are there are sinners who need the hope that you have contained inside of you. There are those who are hurting and have been hurt who need healing and restoration. There are those who are in this community, who are moving in to this place, who are full of God's Spirit, gifted, and looking for a house of worship. And if you, people of God, would pray, God, would you send those, what I call winners. When I pastored, I was praying one day, I said, God, Show me how you're going to grow this church. And the Lord said, if you will ask me for sinners and winners, I'll bring them. I said, Lord, what is a winner? The Spirit of the Lord spoke in my heart about three days later in prayer. The Lord said, I have filled people with my Spirit and given them gifts, and those gifts are the gifts that are missing in your church. Amen. Nobody in your church right now has that gifting, but God said, ask me for them. Ask me for those people. God sent me a man from Indiana and his wife. She was a pharmacist. He owned, he sold his big trucking company. God brought them there out of retirement or to retire. And they showed up one Sunday. That one couple, that one couple filled a gap in my ministry that set us on a new path mm -hmm. because of the training that this man had at his very large church in Indiana. He took over the elders and deacon ministry. He brought structure and organization. And he had the ability to communicate. Amen. God used them. People of God. 
God desires to fill every gap. God desires for sinners to come into the house of the Lord. How do you move into the future and become the people of God to reach the lost service? Here's how you do it. When you're out and about, you talk about your church with such joy in your heart. When you're in Walmart or you're pumping gas and somebody's on the other side, you open up your mouth and you say, Hey, I go to Holt Chapel. You ever heard of it? It's on such and such street. We just moved into our new facility. Can I tell you that in our church service, God changes people's lives. Can I tell you people who are hurting find hope in Jesus? People who are, are struggling in their addictions and sins find deliverance. Can I tell you when you talk about it, they will listen. They will come as you move into your future. Amen. Go into it knowing that God has called you for you. And He is with you. Would you stand with me this morning? I pray. I said, Lord, as I always pray, Lord, how, how do we close this service? I always pray that. I'm going to tell you why I pray that. I pray it because in every church I'm in, on any given Sunday, there's a diversity of needs. There's a diversity of, of emotions going on in people's hearts. As I was praying this morning, I said, Lord, what do you want to do this morning in this church? And the first thing the Lord laid on my heart was simply this. The Lord spoke to my heart. The Lord said, I will to assure my people who are in doubt that I am still their God. Amen. Amen. The Lord said, I want to assure some of my people who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death that I am still their God. And so I want to ask you today, if you need God's assurance, Pastor Brian is going to join me up here if there's some ministry team elders, whomever, that are prayer partners. If you need the assurance of God for what you're walking through, would you come and join us? We want to pray with you this morning. We want to partner with you in prayer because I'm telling you, the devil is a liar and he will put a lie into your mind that God has deserted you and left you to yourself. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And then the Lord spoke to my heart. And the Lord reminded me that there are some who feel like the day of your gifting has passed you by. It's almost like you said in your heart, God, you used to use me in such a powerful way. Lord, what's happened? God, what's happened? Lord, it doesn't seem like I, I'm even useful anymore. And even in your heart, you said, God, as we transition into another facility, Lord, am I just going to get swallowed up in the hype of this new facility? Am I just going to get swallowed up in it? God, am, am I going to be lost even more? If that's been in your heart and God knows your heart, I want you to come and stand before the Lord because the Lord says, I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing in you. You will not get lost. You will not get swallowed up. You will not stop longing for what has been and declare that the blessing of the Lord is in your future. The provision of the Lord is before you. God has not left you. To yourself. He has not left you alone. You are not alone. There is a place for you. And He has already gone ahead of you. And He has established His purpose and His plan for your life. He said, I do a new thing. I do a new thing. And so as you stand before the Lord today, open up your heart and say, Lord, I present myself before you. Do 
past, He's in our future. He prepares the table before Him in the presence of our enemies. He's a good God. He loves you so much. Before I ask Pastor Dixon to come and pray and dismiss us, um, I just want to give some update. Let's sing it one more time. Can we sing it one more time? Yeah. I don't want to cut this short. I know. I don't want to cut this short. No. Let's sing that chorus one more time. If you don't mind. Sing it to him, church. Such an awesome God. So
We thank you, God. We pray, Lord, that you will do something new in our life this week. We pray, God, that you will put a new song in somebody's heart this week. Or do something extraordinary for somebody this week. God, we pray, oh God, that you will change our situations around. Lord, as our faces are different, our problems are different. God, we pray, oh God, things that were left undone, oh God, we pray that this week, oh God, you will visit somebody. We pray for a testimony, oh God. A good testimony, oh God. We come against miserable testimonies in the name of Jesus. We pray, oh God, as we leave from this place, may you go with us. We pray for traveling mercy. We pray, oh God, that your faithfulness will be with us. We bless your name today. May your name be saved. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we are praying. In Jesus' mighty name we are praying. Amen.